I want to use this as an opportunity really to think through with you um, some sort of big picture things that I've been struggling with and thinking about. So I'm going to make a presentation. But um, and after you're done with your pizza, I'm also going to be kind of <laughs> asking you to engage with me because, because I don't, um, you know, th this is an open question. And I don't, I don't know where I stand yet. And I hope we can engage together and really have a conversation. So conversations go. So well, what I want to start is to talk about how we, we really stand today at the nexus of two unfolding dynamics. And on the one hand, we're facing what some could talk about as existential level threats. Look at the news the last few weeks. We've had wildfires. We've had hurricanes. These are connected to climate and to uh, ongoing concerns about the environment and anthropogenic influences on the environment. And so uh, I don't think I have to belabor the fact that this is a matter of great concern to many people. At the same time, we have this increasing polarization in this country and internationally. We have a divergence. And it's not necessarily that people's values have changed dramatically uh, over the last decades. But what has been happening is there's been an increasing amount of social sorting and ideological sorting so that the parties which represent us and the public discourse is more fractured and more divisive uh, than it has been in quite a while. So we have this interplay between environmental concern and between polarization. And we also have fragmentation or fracturing right here. You know, and, and whether it's better or worse, I'm not going to say. But we have a certain uh, academic siloing that goes on that is an inherent part of our academic endeavor. Knowledge fracturing, if you will. Knowledge siloing. So we've got, on the one hand, a fracturing of values and political formations. On the other hand, a fracturing of ways of knowing and knowledge formations. And there's a relationship between these two sorts of dynamics. Hi. Hello. Yeah, come on in. So we have this relationship between values, between, uh, between ways of knowing. And there's many ways to think about this relationship. One way you may have heard of social scientist Dan Kahan, who says that you know, people may have, people who have very different values can look at the same facts and draw very different conclusions. You know, climate change is the classic example, right? Um, it's not so much your scientific knowledge or level of degree of sophistication with regard to the science. It's your ideological positioning and your social grouping that determines what you believe and what you think about climate change. That's one example of the way that our knowledge formations and our values slash political formations are entangled with each other. And maybe another way to think about it is the entanglement we're seeing between what counts as facts and whose facts they are and our political positioning. There, there's, there's real uncertainty when it comes to things like climate change, when it comes to what is the cause of wildfires, when it comes to hurricanes. There's an uncertainty about all these things, but there's also the political manipulation of uncertainty. And so these things get bound up in each other. What I want to have a conversation with you today about as sort of a facilitator here among facilitators, we're all people who I think strive to play a role in the public space of moderating, facilitating, leading, providing some context for as we can work through the fractures, work through the divisions. Uh, and perhaps if we're in the environmental field, it's not just a matter of conflict resolution. It's a matter of actually fostering sustainable change, fostering sustainability, uh, responding to the environmental concerns that we see ourselves as facing. So how do we do that? How do we orient ourselves? And I'm, I'm not interested here in specific techniques or modes, but in the process of orientation where we decide, well, what is the possible, what kind of a situation that I'm dealing with? And what are the appropriate sort of ends? And what is the way that I might navigate through this fractured landscape to support bringing about those ends? And what I want to do is, is talk about two ways to think about the implications of this fracturing that we're experiencing, this social ideological knowledge fracturing. And uh, I'm going to call them fracturing as division and fracturing as multiplicity. And I'm just going to speak metaphorically here for a minute to try to explain what I'm talking about here. So many of you may know the, the, the parable of the blind people and the elephant. And the, the, it's a classic parable in communication studies and in all sorts of fields. We have many people that are touching the different, a different part of the elephant. And they don't know what they're touching at first. One thinks it's a tree trunk. One thinks it's a fire hose. One thinks it's a big plant, whatever they think it is. But through a process of communication, open-mindedness, deliberation, 
listening to each other, telling each other what their experiences are from their perspective, it emerges that, in fact, they're all touching an elephant. So this is fracturing as multiplicity, multiple views on a shared phenomenon, if you will. But we can also have fracturing as division. If you look at the image on the left, some people might look at that a certain way and see a rabbit facing to the right. Some people might look at that another way and see a duck facing to the left. The metaphor here is that people might look at this same phenomenon but draw two very different sets of conclusions and plant their flag based on the particular conclusion that they're experiencing. So I call that fracturing as division. There is no elephant here. Uh, there is only multiple interpretations competing for dominance, if you will. And to pretend in this case that there is an elephant or to be orienting ourselves such that we're trying to get people to, if only people could communicate more, they would get the elephant. They would realize there's an elephant. Well, if we're in this kind of world, we may be struggling down the wrong path. At the same time, if for some of us the elephant is climate change, let's say, and we let go of that because we realize we're in this kind of world, well then we, what, are we not dealing with climate change anymore? So there's this tension that I, this is the, this is the fundamental tension for me, is fracturing as multiplicity and fracturing as division, particularly in dealing with things like climate change in the political environment we're dealing with today. So I want to speak a little bit about two theorists that I think exemplify um, these two perspectives and I think have developed uh, both a philosophical framework and to, to some de degree practical um, programs for responding to their sense of what the fracturing implies. So uh, one is Brian Norton, who's an environmental philosopher, uh, who was my PhD advisor. So I'm not presenting this as extremely, as inherently unbiased. But I will say, to my uh, defense on that, I spent my whole PhD career raising my hand and arguing with Brian and saying, but what about power? What about the fact that there's these irreconcilable issues? So, so while I'm inherently in, uh, biased in a sense, and, and still am, I think, to a degree towards Brian's view, I'm also recognize its limitations, and that recognition has only become stronger as I watch the political dynamics around me. Um, the other theorist is a Belgian uh, political theorist named Chantal Mouffe, which I was introduced to by a colleague at ESF, and she said, oh, you should read this book on the political. And I was like, wow, this is a really interesting book. And she was fundamentally critical of deliberative democracy, which for me was like the thing. I mean, deliberative democracy is, is it. You know, we, we, we need to create a democracy where we come together around elephants. And yet her point was that conflict um, is essential and should not be ignored. And in fact, when we paper over conflict and produce consensus, what we do is we kick conflict down the road and make it worse. And so we need, therefore, to create structures to embrace, live with, and support conflict uh, in a way that is not ultimately destructive but honors the irreconcilability. So to go a little bit deeper, I'm going to talk about Brian's work a little bit. So Brian uh, emphasizes the power of reasoned deliberation. He emphasizes empirical experience, but not because empirical experience of the facts tell us the truth, but because through a process of a community deliberating and then testing out what they come to within actual experience and then learning from that experience and then deliberating some more, they can reach agreement. And not only that, they can learn both together about what's important and about what works in the world. Um, and he specifically calls for a public discourse. And through that discourse, we can identify key values that need to be sustained. If, for example, the public interest is to be sustained, or for example, if we're going to try to uh, pursue a sustainable pathway, then we need to figure out what are the values for sustainability and what is the public that might be pursuing those values. <laughs> or on a more smaller scale, if there's a problem of water pollution, <coughs> We need to figure out what is the public that is invoked in that problem. Then we need to figure out a way to engage that public in some sort of discourse that can then yield a pathway forward. And it's always an iterative learning pathway forward. It's never the answer. Uh, but he has a deep faith in that process. Uh, he says, and I just talked to him the other day, so these are just direct words that he said. He said, if people start trusting and stop seeing the others as the enemy, then we can start to talk about what we can do together, because in many cases, there is underneath a shared value. If the process is well designed and is working well, 
people will make better decisions because they'll learn from each other, and even though they may have started out on opposite sides of the problem. So we have a sense of uh, Brian Norton's philosophy, which he, he's written several books. His first one was Toward a Unity Among Environmentalists that speaks to this, uh, and the latest is Sustainable Values, Sustainable Change. In terms of thinking about fracturing as division, we have an emphasis on the impossibility of reconciling alternative points of view and on the fundamental importance of what Mouffe calls adversarial relationships and what she also calls agonistic relationships, which she gets from the Greek agon, which is a, which is a champion uh, fighting for what they believe in or for what they value or what they care about. And so she believes in this agonism and she distinguishes it. And I, I, I really I think this is what drew me to her originally. I thought was a powerful distinction was this distinction between agonism and antagonism. So can we learn to be, for her, agonism is the championing. Antagonism is championing plus destruction of the other. So she tries to say, can we find a way to be agonistic, to champion, to fight, but not in a way that involves demonizing or making an enemy out of the other. So adversary good, enemy bad. I think for her, an enemy, uh, is only is necessary to the extent that an enemy is trying to undermine the democratic process, then we may have to exclude some from the very public because of that. But we want, but she's concerned on kind of maintaining that agonistic adversarial space. But very clearly, there is no public sphere, there is no neutral ground that we can all stand on because anytime you claim this is the we, you know, I had this anthropology teacher, and every time I said we, he would just call me on it because he was like, well, who we? What we are you talking about? And I, you know, we do that. We do that, don't we? Naturally, <laughs> all right? And, but to me, to say we is automatically to make assumptions about if I'm in this room about all of you, and maybe you don't see things the same way I do. And to say we on a global scale, well, we are concerned about biodiversity. Let's say well, when I'm working in a country where people are really concerned about their livelihoods, they may not be concerned about biodiversity at all. And my invocation of that we serves to marginalize and disempower someone who may see things very differently or be living, having a very different lived experience. So, uh, you know, there is no public ground. There is, the invocation of the we is a non-neutral statement. It's factually a rhetorical strategy of me to gain power in that dynamic, perhaps over someone who doesn't have as much power as I do to begin with. And so all she sees is the competing, what she calls hegemonies, or many have used this term, these competing he hegemonic structures uh, in arguing for what gets to be the public, but there is no natural born public. Public is just a rhetorical strategy. Public is an act of power. She says, if we want people to be free, we must always allow for the possibility that conflict may appear and provide an arena where differences can be confronted. She says, the agonistic encounter is a confrontation where the aim is neither the annihilation nor the assimilation of the other, and where the tensions between the different approaches contribute to enhancing the pluralism that characterizes a multipolar world. She's invoking division here, right? Division that cannot be reconciled through deliberation no matter how much we talk. <clears throat> so, and I'm checking my time here. So I think I want to have a very brief discussion before I move on. I have some more to say. But the first question I, and I have is for the designer or the facilitator of a public engagement process, right? I'm not asking like to describe the world or what's more descriptive. I'm, I'm not asking that question. I'm saying is, as folks who care about supporting uh, meaningful engagement among diverse actors around problems. What are the implications if we understand fracturing on the one hand is multiplicity and on the other hand is division? How does it shape how we might just think about the problem and our role in facilitating any sorts of, I'm about to say resolution, but resolution might not even be the right word. Uh, but I'd love to hear any of your thoughts on just how, if this means something to you as a facilitator or would-be facilitator and how you might approach things differently, taking on these, these mantles. Anybody want to share something before I call on people that I know? Yeah. <laughs> so just to throw out a, a very hot topic, that's our income gap. Say again? The income gap is a The income gap, topic. great, yeah. Well, if you brought people together to, to correct income gap, and you had an open sheet of paper on the wall, and you said, well, what's our agenda? And you never got to do we actually have a budget to do anything about this? Or do we want to not even spend our own, spend our money on our process, but give our money to someone who doesn't have money, rather than coming up with a budget for our process? 
I'm just throwing that out as, a, as a, an example of what your process is, because I, what I see is that in public welfare, in the public welfare scheme of things, you have needs, and half of the budget goes to the people who are addressing the needs. Yeah. I, I think that's a nice example, and I think what I like about how you talked about that example is it's clear that the process is not just about the process. It's about the position of the process itself within a lar embedded in a larger set of dynamics. And the process itself is a choice and perhaps is a, is a way of diverting energy, resources, et cetera, away from dealing with the real issues. Uh, maybe not, but, but that, that it's embedded in a larger set of social and political dynamics. And as one who's facilitating the process, it's not just a question of, do I put the paper in the front of the room or the back of the room? Do I give everybody a sticky note? Do I, you know, it's not just that. It's, it's thinking about the, the very process itself and what it means and what it implies and what it does or doesn't do within that larger sphere. And I think that's exactly right. And so the process, if we're, if we're in a sort of multiplicity, we sort of assume that the process has value because we're getting people to talk about income inequality and what to do about it, and that must be a valuable thing to do. And yet, if there's all these forces arrayed around us, and we know very well that that conversation is going to have no value and, in fact, waste, maybe waste, be a waste of time and resources, then we're failing to engage the fight that we should be fighting. We, and we're failing to engage the division that is, in fact, probably beneath income inequality or arguably beneath income inequality. Is that a fair reflection of what you're I'd getting say, at? And as you're talking, my, my input would be to identify what disposable income, what, what actor or what process would actually be able to change. Mm -hmm. In other words, who is actually where, where is the power lie? Could, change, could actually yeah. change the yeah. income uh, disparity. Yeah. yeah, so you're not focusing on what's the nature of the conversation we need to have. You're saying, where do we push? Where's the lever that's going to make a difference? Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts that somebody wants to? Yeah. Another example comes to mind from Professor Gerard's class, the issue of the I-81 project. It seems like we're on the right talking about different perspectives on the elephant versus maybe we need to deal with the vision aspect of that conversation. So there may be some sort of ignoring of the vision by having being so focused on yeah. sort of the technical details of mm -hmm. something where we yeah. ignore the elephant in the room by focusing on the elephant on the paper. Yeah. Um, other thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I think it doesn't necessarily have to be a binary, either or division and multiplicity. It could be both. Uh, yes. Some cases are division, in some cases multiplicity. Fair enough. And, and, and I don't, what I'm not trying to do is ask the question or figure out for myself which is the right method. Um, it's more like, I think your, you know, your point speaks to how do we begin to recognize the different contexts that we may be engaging and be able to sort of ask ourselves what our orientation might, should, could, is within that dynamic, and perhaps reorient ourselves. It's sort of a taking a step back. But, but clearly, or at least from my perspective, they both have value, and it's not a duality. There's, there's probably, in reality, multiple blends and shift back and forth on a moment's notice, perhaps. Um, did you want to say something? Well, following up on that, they're, you've made them very different, and um, to some extent, uh, we share some values with everybody, and some things and other things we don't, and we have different interests, um, and then there's different ways of pursuing it as if it were yeah. shared, because that way is maybe convince some people. So. To all this border area yes. where we live in. Um, but I think it's useful to see that what, what, what alternatives are pretty uh, different, and, and even if they blend together or they work for some things and not for others, or for some people and not for others. But I, and I guess um, some of us in the field whatever it is the field <laughs> that we're in, um, is how we um, conduct the struggle as well as 
struggling with versus not struggling and trying to reach yeah. the new thing. It's, it's, it's to, to fight without producing enemies um, to win over. And if there are some people that you can't, maybe you try to undermine them <laughs> by appealing to what is reasonable in your own mind from, from that side. Yeah. No, I appreciate the points about the this is a you know a model and meant meant to challenge our thinking and not, and and, uh, and the boundary spaces are essential and that's I agree that's where we live. The the question that I want to move to now is sort of not just sort of a as facilitators in general but going back to the first thing is people who are worried about the environment and trying to move forward you know sustainable coming from a sustainability at ESF you know when I teach public uh, participation classes. It's interesting, it's really not from the, a neutral standpoint. I mean, when you're facilitating uh, from that standpoint, you're actually trying to facilitate a positive outcome with respect to the environment. So you're not necessarily saying, I'm just gonna accept whatever emerges from this process, because there are certain things that are much more favorable than others, right? M working towards sustainable change is, is where we wanna go over time. Um, and so, what I'm, what I want to move to now is how we think about these two way orientations in relationship to the challenge of sustainable change. And I've, this is me trying to work this out for myself. So remember we've got fracturing as division or multiplicity on the one hand, and fracturing on the one hand of, uh, of values and political formations, and on the other hand of ways of knowing and knowledge formations. And I think this is something that's perhaps not completely unique to the environmental, environmental domain, but, per, per, um, but certainly essential for the environmental domain because science and technical dimensions are so important in environmental problems and they're so politicized. And uh, I think that's, to me, one of the things that makes them interesting and challenging, but it, it also means that it's not just a factor of getting the right people around the table because it's also figuring out how to bring in the right scientific perspective in the right way. That's not going to uh, dominate unfairly uh, but that's also going to offer something productive to the conversation. So there's another dimension that, that comes into play here, which is why I separate them. Um, with the acknowledgement, as I said earlier, these things are profoundly interconnected. So um, I was compelled to do a two-by-two two matrix because <laughs> that's, that's what you do, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> but, but it helps, you know? It, 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 we, they help. Um, so move talks about agonistic pluralism. This is her phrase to, to talk about sort of the political, the politics that she thinks we need to be thinking about or we need to be realizing that we dwell within, which is a plurality, right? Or, but that's another way of saying it. Pluralism doesn't always mean this. I think pluralism could very much mean a variety of things. But for her, pluralism means the agonistic engagement of irreconcilable difference over time in a political space. Um, and I think when Brian Norton talks, he's really talking about deliberative inclusivism. Like inherently, we think it's an elephant. If we have enough conversation for enough time, we can continue to expand the circle of people who are going to agree and see that it's an elephant and be able to act on the elephant because that's the power of deliberation, right? It's a power of engaging people over time around shared issues. So, and, and it's an inclusive process. It's inherently inclusive. It's, 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 we're expanding the sphere of engagement. Um, but on the, on the knowledge side, and here's like, this is what we, this is speaks to, I think, us in the academic space, and what I've spent a lot of my time working on these days is interdisciplinary collaboration and the barriers to interdisciplinary collaboration because I find that all the same dynamics or many of the same dynamics are present in, within the academic spaces when people are trying to work across the boundaries of the nat natural and social sciences or even various boundaries within the social sciences. And um, all kinds of issues come up, right? Power, respect institutional dynamics. And it's the, a, a perfect place to, to look at the interplay between intellectual ideas, scientific ideas on the one hand, and issues around power and values on the other hand. And so, but it's, 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 so what are these different spaces when it comes down to ways of knowing? I mean, on the one hand, I like the phrase thinking together. From a multiplicity standpoint, when we're doing academic or interdisciplinary work, we're trying to put our different minds around a shared problem. And yet, there may be the, the individual or the uh, perspective within that that points out that, you know what, the very way you're defining that problem is part of the problem. You know, you've taken on, you know, you're, 
so, you know, there's a, you're doing an economistic analysis, which inherently assumes that things can be counted, which really fundamentally shouldn't be being counted. And so with, even within the academic space, there is a, this sort of opportunity and possibility and importance of offering what I would call critique, rec you know, recognizing the way that power is playing into what pres presumptively an intellectual exchange. Or one can turn that lens on oneself, and that's reflexivity. One says, well, what, what am I bringing to the table? I think I'm just having a nice dialogue here. But in fact, you know, uh, if I'm doing it with my students, then I'm the faculty, and they're the student, and that automatically creates a dynamic of what maybe what can and can't be said, and there's all other kinds of dynamics that can be looked at if I just turn the mirror on myself. Um, so it's just, just to remind us, I'm, I'm really looking to orient. I'm looking to, it, and it's an, it, I think the reason I put this color wheel up here is to point out it's an art more than a science to figure out where we are. I'm not trying to look at where you fit in these things. And I, and I think this speaks, things bleed across all these boundaries. But I think we can, uh, and the other point here is we can create a palette. What I'm looking to do and, and where I really want my work to go is when we're evaluating the context of, a, of an issue, can we create, can we look carefully at it and build a palette for ourselves that allows us to engage thoughtfully and constructively and creatively? Like the palette would, you know, I think in this case I need to be really emphasize deliberative inclusivism with a little bit of critique and reflexivity, if you will. So we need a little yellow, we need a little purple, let's put it together, there's my palette, let's go. Or maybe you're gonna be the yellow, you're gonna do the purple, because you're good at that, we're gonna do it together, it's gonna be great, we're gonna be complementary. So it's just a way of thinking about the different things that may be relevant, the different orientations that may be relevant within a given problem space, and consciously trying to bring them to the table, a little proactively. Um, let me give you some brief examples, and then I'll have, we'll have the rest of the discussion. So. Of, of contexts where I sort of see these different dynamics playing out. Um, so, you talk about Paris, the Paris Accords. I think we're a great uh, example of multiplicity, right? The, the global community coming around a shared problem, climate change. That was the elephant, right? We have to, and there was all kinds of arguments, disagreements over the years. And what happened, you know, as we move from Kyoto to Paris, we kind of, in fact, relax divisions, I would say. Because in the Kyoto Protocol, you had something called historical accountability or historical responsibility, where you said countries that have been responsible for the problem need to pay more to countries that have been the victims of this problem, which is arguably why George Bush didn't sign the Kyoto Protocols, because that was a very problematic thing to accept in a global context. And that causes a lot of division, right? To say, to say well, we can't come to an agreement, and, and, this is a real dynamic that occurs in, multi, in global climate agreements. So certain actors will say, we're not going to come to an agreement until you agree that you've been the one causing the problem, and I've been the one suffering, and you agree that you're going to help me deal with it. And the other group saying, you know what? We're all here today. We are we are. We, we certainly need to deal with this. We may all have different responsibilities. Common but differentiated responsibilities is the technical term. But let's move forward together and not worry about the past. That's what Paris was. Let's move forward together and not worry about the past. There are certainly payments from developed to developing countries, but there's no inherent mechanism built in whereby we need to be historically accountable for the past. So it's a break from Kyoto in that sense, and I would argue that it's a moving past division towards kind of multiplicity. We all have a role to play, let's play our role. <clears throat> it, within the knowledge space, I think things like when you hear about the moon, the moon shot or whether we're all gonna put our minds together to solve cancer, uh, or go to the moon, or whatever it is, you know, NSF has all sorts of these, to say we need to bring different disciplines around this shared problem. And that's an example that I won't go into detail of, <coughs> of when we're trying to bring multiple ways of knowing around a shared problem. The other ones are a little trickier. I want to spend a little more time on those. So <coughs> when we're dealing in the, this was a, I used to teach high school, and this is a picture one of my high school students drew that I always liked, which I think represents reflexivity really well. Um, and by the way, is that an elephant? <laughs> Does it? Does anybody see what's wrong with it? Well, you made the trunk a leg. <laughs> it's an illusion of an elephant. It's actually not an elephant, right? It's something that looks like an elephant on first glance, but then actually not an elephant. Sometimes our understanding, what we think is an elephant, is not an elephant. And in fact, it's a way of covering up the inconvenience presence of pieces that just don't fit. 
<laughs> and so what critique is, is when we question the urge to synthesize. We, as human beings, we're just brilliant at seeing patterns. That's just what we do. And we need to question that invocation of patterns on the phenomenon we see and, and, and look for ways that, in fact, those patterns are, are, the, the, are leaving out marginalized perspectives or disempowering marginalized perspectives, either in explicit or implicit ways. And again, reflexivity is just turning that onto ourselves and asking ourselves, well, how are we embedded in these systems of knowledge and power? <clears throat> and how is that shaping, you know, am I just the loud voice in the room and everybody's agreeing it's an elephant because I'm the loudest person? Uh, and they're just not talking? Or is, in fact, we're really having a real discussion here? When I go to fracturing, uh, the example I want to use is the New York State process around hydraulic fracturing in the state, which happened a few years ago. <clears throat> and um, I worked with Jack Mano, who was really involved with this, and wrote a paper with him, um, where the point was that the whole public discourse was framed around hydraulic fracturing and the whole public engagement processes was framed around rights, land rights, and uh, balancing competing rights. And this was the, the discursive process. But from the Haudenosaunee perspective, you know, it's more about the cultural, spiritual, and economic responsibilities that come with property ownership. And there wasn't space for collective responsibility within the discourse. So the fact that the discourse was construed in terms of rights left out, it didn't just leave out somebody from the perspective, it led out the possibility of a certain kind of conversation. Um, it also, you know, th there's a co other complicating factor in that the Native American engagement within a state level process should really be through sovereign to sovereign communication at the national level uh, because they're sovereign territories. So that's another issue. And I think about, I was always struck by this and, and frankly struggled with this. This is the two row wampum that was just honored, the 400 year anniversary of the treaty between the Dutch and, and, the, um, and the Native Americans made here. And it symbolizes you know, two canoes traveling down the river of life, but you notice they're parallel to each other. They don't intersect. It symbolizes division. It symbolizes, you know what, you're, you're going to do your thing. We're going to do our thing. We can support each other, talk, have, be friends, go down the river of life, hopefully sustainably forever, but we're not trying to be one. And I struggle with that, right, as a sort of wannabe universalist, right? I, I, like, I want us all to be one. And yet, I think this is a real challenge to say, to, for me and maybe others to struggle with, what does it mean to, to, to actually talk about separation or division and take that seriously as a mode of engagement, sovereign to sovereign, if you will. So here's the question that, that I want to have the rest of our discussion about. Um, is really like, <clears throat> OK, we've got this distinction between fracturing and multiplicity, and fracturing is division. So as we work towards sustainable change, I mean, again, where I come from, in this is, you know, I remember being 11 or 12 years old and I think learning about climate change or something, global environmental issues for the first time and recognizing that this was something where just humanity had to come together around. Like this was what we needed to do. And it was just very clear to me. And then as I went through school and graduate school, then you realize that, I mean, that there's profound division and that even that was a sort of very privileged stance for me to be taking in a sense. And so I, I sort of problematize that. And yet I still believe it, but I also realize that it's more complex, that my invocation of the we all need to get together needs to be sort of challenged now and again. So in multiplicity, what Brian Norton would say is that, well, how do we, how do we adapt to these changing circumstances? How do we create pathways for sustainable change in a world that's in trouble? He would say, you know, the right process opens up new possibilities and allows us to change in response to changing situations. It's the process that allows adaptation. You know, it's not like we all know, it's not like uh, we all add, vote and there's a solution. It's like through dialogue we change our understanding, we change our ability to engage, we adapt through multiplicity. Um, and for change to be sustainable, we have to take into account different skills of time, learning, learning, learning towards what we only conceptualize as the end of the process. There is no end. But having the assumption that there's some elephant there, that there's something we share, even if we're not going to get to it today, allows us to take that next step and adapt together. Whereas Moof would say, what would she say about, again, sustainability? I'm not interested in this as just in terms of conflict resolution or collaboration, but in terms of if we're in an agonistic world, if we accept as I think we sort of have to to some degree, given politics today, that there's, that there's limits on deliberation, that, it, that 
that, that we have to find other ways of engaging that can't be purely defined by deliberative democracy or the possibilities of deliberation. And yet, what does it mean to work for sustainable change once we accept those limits or to be working towards sustainability? So I, I just like some of your reactions or to help me clarify the question maybe, if necessary, and, and maybe we can discuss that. We have a little bit of time left, do we? Okay, great. So does anybody want to just see if you can reflect back to me the kind of question I'm asking or, or your take on it? So define sustainable change. Well, to me, well, define sustainable change. <laughs> sustainable change is, I see I can only define sustainable change. This is the problem. I can define it over here. I can, you know, and, and we can work on it together. I can say sustainable change is what we as, when we as a community come together with scientists who are engaged as part of a public discourse, helping us understand the dynamics that we're dealing with, giving us tools to learn from those dynamics, and supporting a community level process of adapt, adapting to those dynamics and learning from every step we take. I mean, it would be something like that, but that's presuming that we can have some sort of community level understanding. So I can, I can define sustainability at the community level or I can imagine myself helping a community define sustainability on the community's terms supported by science and scientific practices and knowledge. But I struggle over here to define, can't, I mean, I don't know how to define sustainable change over here to be quite honest. Uh, and yet, I mean, I, I, can, I can imagine then that sustainable change becomes a kind of one interest among many mm -hmm. that then you know, has to fight the political fight and maybe win others over. Uh, you know, it becomes much more of a positional politics, yeah. almost something akin almost to, to an identity politics or something. But I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to quite accept that. I don't want to accept that about identity politics either, but that's another, another question. So. Would somebody else define sustainable change over here or, or help me out? Or uh, you're welcome to ask any other questions. Um, or, well, yeah. the, the, you need baselines, first of all. I mean, for example, Amazon is about, I think, at about the third year of a study uh, group research project to define the human body baseline. Yeah, and okay. Yet, and yet we have medical schools for the last 200 years. So, and, and kind of what I'm going for is measurement. Yeah. It, it's hard, I mean, you can define sustainable, but I don't think you can just define sustainable without some baselines and measurement of effects. And um, you might say, what is the comfort level of plants and animals, flora and fauna, with certain processes that have a chemical impact? Mm -hmm. I mean, without, without a measurable baseline that gets at comfort and but you're presuming when you say measurable, I think that brings up a, a, an important set of points because I'm not saying you're saying this, but there's a potential presumption behind that that there's an objective measurement that can be made. And that is certainly from a perspective of division, I think that can be challenged, right? Any objective baseline is itself seen from a certain standpoint, a tool of power used by one subgroup to get what they want, in a sense. Or, you know, we all know that measurements have power. We all know that, you know, if you want to change, if you want to change something, first count it. So I think saying that, like, measurement and power are related isn't that big a step. And then that becomes problematic. I mean, look at the world today. What's a fact? What's not a fact? What's the truth? What's not the truth? I agree for the power of being. The power of being. The power of being, in other words, the power of, of life to pursue its own growth. Yeah. I'm not arguing for the power of who gets to say. Okay. I'm arguing on the basis of what is. Why do we need to measure it if it is? is? Well, but there is an impact of thing between things. There's interaction yeah. of the is's. Yes, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, that's an, and uh, maybe maybe there's something there. An interaction of the ises. I think that's getting at a nice sort of agonistic uh, perspective. I like that. Yeah, Lou. Um, go back to this book project that you were so intimately involved in. I remember that. Um, that you know, is there there's good conflict, bad 
but there's good collaboration. I remember Bad somebody making that point, too. <laughs> and um, what you're calling, I mean, I would say, well, we got to pay attention to doing conflict well. Um, that's the only way that we're going to really be open to, to getting a hearing. And um, for sure, but if it's done badly, it's counterproductive. If it's done badly, it's, um, people are are not heard who should be heard. There's but can you smashed. speak speak to sustainability though, or environmental well, that, problems? That would be sustainable, I think, because it, it's inevitable, and and if it's done badly, it's not sustainable. You have disaster. You, people are are. Destroyed. And do you see the sustainability as you're defining it, which is sort of at the level of a conflict? Is how do you see that related to environmental sustainability? Is that is that sort of part and parcel? Yeah, there, whatever you do, some people will be hurt more than others, mm -hmm. and some people will gain more than others. And how do you decide who should pay what to whom benefit? Uh, now or five years from now or but that 10 years all, I from agree now. with that but that also occurs in a larger context that's not that's maybe about future generations or ecological yeah. dynamics so it's not even just those people if you're thinking environmental terms it's not just the people and the dynamics it's you know the life support systems yes. uh, that are questions and you know who, yeah who's going to represent the unborn um, who will be born Maybe. Yeah. Um, but that probably uh, that would be decided to some extent by contention over values. And, uh, but uh, but to deny that, that that some people's hurts are to be paid attention to by would be a mistake. Yeah, Catherine. So I'm not sure I'm getting agonistic. So if agonistic simply means the ability of, you know, competing positions to be competing positions, and for the and the people who have those positions to be able to engage in pointing them out, discussing them, not towards resolution or uh, you know uh, some sort of uh, pulling together collaborative process, but everyone you're not trying to bring the divisions together, but allow them to have voice. Then what happens? Because then it seems like it's either power that makes the ultimate decision, or there's got to be some process, which is, if, I, there, if there's some resolution, and if it's not a collaborative resolution, then what, what's Then the, what makes the resolution? What makes the resolution? <laughs> well, I think, one, it's, it's sort of a philosophy of ongoing struggle, on the one hand. You know, I, I, I don't know that that fully answers it, but I... I so it's, it's a win-lose? Um, I certainly wouldn't be defined in win-win terms, because I think that does depend on sort of multiplicity and on some shared process. I think it's, it's more a philosophy of ongoing struggle. Um, and it occurs within a larger democratic context. Um, but not, I mean, if you think about sort of traditional notions of democracy versus deliberative democracy, I mean, decisions happen that don't have anything to do with what people are talking about. Right. And so I think it's more living in that space. It's it's more rec it's not talking about things and in in struggle. It's, it's maybe not spending your time talking as much. And yes, I think power becomes much more important. Then you get sustainable dynamic. change depending on whether the people in power yeah. want it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What strikes me also on either side, and and following up on Professor Kreisberg's comment about doing conflict well is the forum that brings to light the process. So having a conversation about, you know, we have competing interests and as a result, if we just play a power game, someone is going to lose and those stakes could be really high impacting future generations. So how do we look at the process of how we're addressing this? Because I feel as though in a lot of our conflicts nationally, dialogues are not going so well. Yeah. 
and and so we have you know positions you know people fighting um, using social media and other means so is there a way to elevate how we look at problems versus the focus on the problem itself but let's think about as a democracy a larger scale yeah. to, to expand the scope to mm -hmm. talk about the, the, the ground that we're sort of walking on not the specific argument we're having right which right. so you're saying even though at this smaller scale we might not be able to perhaps it's not correct to assume an elephant and at some larger scale future generations might be the thing that mm -hmm. we can organize our thinking around for example mm -hmm. um, yeah. you want to make yeah, taking that forward, I was thinking maybe an agonistic approach at times, what best you can achieve is try to convey your viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And then that can, that can probably lead to rephrasing of the issue, rephrasing of the problem. So rather than pitting, uh, for instance, uh, livelihood versus uh, biodiversity conservation. So many people protested when, when they think that their livelihoods are going, going to get affected. Right. And that can lead to an agonistic approach. Mm -hmm. But that in turn can lead the government to rephrase the issue. Yeah. The rephrase the issue and see it, it not as likelihood versus sustainable uh, biodiversity conservation, but protecting uh, biodiversity while promoting sustainable livelihoods. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so that's, that, that is one instance where I can see an agonistic approach leading to rephrasing of a yeah. problem and a sustainable that, I, I, I really yeah. like that answer. Mm -hmm. uh, you're saying that we, you, and I like it so much because we often kind of presume the, a problem is the way that it's been handed to us. This is the problem, now let's work within the confines of the problem as given. And you're saying it's very important to be agonistic, perhaps, at the level of problem definition. Yeah. And, and, and Unless and until we can agree, we can all agree on the nature of the problem, because it is the problem framing that leads us down the path right. where we're not even thinking about what we should be thinking about. No, I, I think that's a fantastic answer. Personally, mm -hmm. and there are models internationally that you can look at where they have addressed both sides. Mm -hmm. So that's a good point too. Well, yeah. Oh, Karen, go ahead. This reframing is really similar to your paper from a few years ago about trade-offs and biogenders of conservation. And like the conversation is constantly changing based on the compliments coming about through the intervention. So it's an interesting, like I, I think looking at your work as a whole, like seeing this change that you're making from trade-offs to fracturing is really mm -hmm. like a, a, a reframing yourself, right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. trying to come to That's, I really appreciate that. Yeah, that's. I agree. I mean, I mean, the, the, <laughs> I'm aware of my own tendency to to really want us all to be able to get around the table, and sort things out. And I'm also aware. And I, you know, even if even in my personal life, of how when that ends up leaving something really important out of the picture that just doesn't fit around the table, in, in, at least in the way the problem is currently defined. I think that's a really nice point, and. Um, and maybe the ways I've glossed over that. Or, and I've also experienced ways that I've made room for that and how then when you make room for it, and again, just on the personal level, now you deal with things like grief and loss and win-lose. You know, because I think every, I mean, I was, you know, win-win is just two people saying that there's a win. It doesn't mean it's, it's also probably a win-win-loss. <laughs> loss, loss, question mark. Because the world is big and complex, right? And so when you're inviting it in, you're inviting in the losses and question marks, and it's just not as, you know, it's harder. We live on fractured. We're living on fractured ground. We can't be quite as happy with ourselves. Um, and yet through kind of embracing the fracturing or the pain or the loss or the grief or the failure to have it be what you want it to be or the incompleteness of it, or maybe sometimes, going to the first point, by like not facilitating. I, I can name specific processes where I, the best thing I could have done, which I didn't have the guts to do, was to say, you know what, I, it's not appropriate for me to be doing this at this time. I'm, you guys are going to have to do some more work or get to a different place or, you know, you only, I see that in the room are like only the people that are like advocating on this side of things and not the people, <laughs> and you want us to sort it out, but 
I should have refused to facilitate. I would be so proud of myself that I'd not been able to do that. But instead, I went and facilitated what everybody knew was bogus. And I leave feeling like crap, you know? So I call that like constructive disengagement. <laughs> I wish that I could constructively disengage from things. I think that's sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is constructively disengage. Um, or reframe the problem, and that's a more positive way to put it. Uh, and, you, and your way, too, is to expand uh, the set of concerns. I think there's another way of saying the same thing. Just another quick metaphor that has helped me think about this. It's not, not maybe a perfect one, but uh, when I was writing it, this came from a paper that I wrote, that, uh, which was a fest shrift, like sort of a celebratory um, book for Brian. Norton, my PhD advisor, where I was sort of trying to say, I sat in graduate school, I raised my hand, I complained all the time, let me try to write about some of this stuff and see what I think now. And I used the metaphor of um, divorce uh, mediation versus marriage counseling. And I, I mean, sort of where I came to was like, Brian is kind of like trying to be a marriage counselor, where he's saying like, look, we just all need to get along and find, you know, we have family, common, move forward. And maybe what's needed a little bit more now is not to throw out his whole thing at all, but figuring out how to use what he's saying, but take into account maybe some of Moves and obviously other thinkers, this reality and figuring out what does it take to be a divorce mediator a little bit, where there is still something shared. And there may be kids that really matter to everybody. And yet people are pursuing their own paths in very different light, you know, life paths. And, and there may be a lot of contention and controversy, and we're not going to all be a happy family, unfortunately, anymore. You know, and I don't want to take that metaphor too far. You know, uh, I'm not saying, like, say goodbye or separate the world in strange ways. I'm just saying we may need to accept that some of our notions of wholeness, you know, of unity, like, aren't going to be fulfilled, at least in the short term or at least in the superficial way, and allow for some of the division and fracturing to enter the space. So that, and I think I really want to end on that next, so that we can reframe the problem in better ways. And, you know, and again, I'm, it's my tendency to be over here. I'm not the one... I'm not sure I'm qualified to speak to what it really means to dwell over here over the long term because, you know, I'm sure others could speak to that. But, but I really like, you know, we have to enter this space to be able to come back to that space is, is certainly one thing I would take on. Are we good on time? We wrap up? Finally, yeah. The, the question comes to me of who owns the problem. <laughs> For example, the commons. Yeah. Which is a framing, a problem framing already. You just invoked a whole world of what something is and isn't by just saying the comments, by the way. But go ahead. Well, the air, I mean, it's not like all the air from Syracuse, all of it always gets to China. You know, it may get divided up and some may go through, you know, northern Russia and some may go through Africa and the, the trip around. But um, to actually have a better sense, the second thing for me for, that I want to say is they have a better sense of acting with the commons, you know, with the commons as, yeah. uh, uh, you know, Mother Earth's uh, elements, yeah. attributes, uh, human, other humans. I really kind of think that, that we need a, a much better uh, appreciation of being of the commons as and for example probably few people a few people in this room probably have a number that equates with their carbon footprint through the year or through the last five mm -hmm. years but isn't it true largely or objectively that each of us have created a carbon footprint uh, in the last five years but we don't know it and, and we don't even, therefore, we have no sense of its size, so we might own up to that, but we really might not own up to its size yeah. because it hasn't been, it hasn't been an element of uh, my value to the commons or plus or minus to the commons. Yeah. And making that, um, that commons tangible or, or, mm -hmm. or the, the earth, and that there's one earth and one atmosphere tangible, and real um, seems to be, and, and limited to some degree, seems to be, to me also, to be necessary for sustainable change. Um, and the fact that we unfortunately live in a political context where 
actually that's not a straightforward claim, you know, necessarily, right? That carbon is a thing we should worry about, you know. So, so that's why I think we also and and people have legitimate values and are worrying about real things equally big, like national security, or like economic competitiveness, or like sovereignty, when they say, well, we're not going to do the Paris Treaty, actually. Like, like the, it, it's because equally, well, it's because of a rabbit. If you're talking about a duck in the commons, somebody else is talking about the rabbit of national sovereignty and economic competitiveness. And then if we don't stay economically competitive as a country, then all the other things we care about are out the window. You know, so so there's your duck of the global atmosphere, and this person's rabbit of economic security and national sovereignty. And um, I would love to see us reframe the problem so that those can actually both be at the table. I think we failed to do that yet. I think we. On various sides, we formulate the problem in a way that really doesn't allow the conversation, the real conversation among real competing different values and the hard choices that will actually be problematic no matter what that we may need to make to move forward sustainably. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have today, but let's uh, give uh, Professor Hirsch a round of applause. Mm -hmm.